Back by popular demand, it is Big 12 tier list time. We are going to rank Big 12 coaches today by which tier they belong in. If you are unfamiliar, courtesy of our friends at Tier Maker, I will be placing Big 12 head coaches into what tier I believe they belong to. So let's go ahead and get Tier Maker pulled up here. So you can see for the uninitiated, we have the S tier, that is the highest tier. We have the A tier, the B tier, the C tier, and the D tier. I will go left to right with the coaches here, rank them accordingly, so we will put these coaches into tiers, which I'm sure will draw lots of T-E-A-R-S tiers in the comments. Make sure you let me know what you think. Whether you love me, hate me, anything, let me know in the comments where I'm right or wrong on all of these coaches. Stick up for your guy in the comments, all right? If I'm being a hater, stick up for your guy and let me know. We're going to start here with Dave Aranda. And by the way, as I rank these coaches, keep in mind, this is S tier or A tier relative to the rest of the Big 12 coaches, not necessarily relative to all the coaches in college football. So an S tier coach here does not necessarily mean they're an S tier coach in college football. It means relative to the rest of the Big 12, they are. But I think most of the coaches that are going to wind up in the S tier here are damn near in that tier all across college football because there are some good coaches in this league. Dave Aranda, a couple of years ago at Baylor, would have been in the S tier. Guy wins the Big 12, wins the Sugar Bowl, has just a tremendous season, wins 12 games. And you're thinking, man, the Zen Master has it figured out. But it has not gone well since then for Aranda. It's knocked him to me all the way down to the C tier, which it's tough. That's a little harsh, but he's 11 and 23 at Baylor outside of the 1 12 and 2 season. So I need to see things on the up and up. I mean, a lot of Baylor fans, it seemed like, wanted him gone. He's got his job. He's got a new quarterback in Daquan Finn, who certainly could move him up the list. But for right now, I think I've got to go C tier for Aranda. And that's where I'm going to go with Brent Brennan at Arizona, who is next on the list as well. Brennan is the inkblot test, the old Rorschach test, I believe it's called. If you show two people the same blots of ink on a piece of paper, one will tell you that it looks like something completely different than the next person. That's how this works with Brennan's resume at San Jose State, where he was before Arizona. 34 and 48 overall record. So one person will look at that and say, well, that is just awful. How did he get a power five head coaching job? The next person would look at it and say, well, San Jose State is one of the toughest places in the country to win. And Brennan went to a bowl game three of his last four years at San Jose State. They had only been to three bowl games in 11 years before he got there. So that is a pretty big accomplishment for them to do that. I understand how there's going to be some bickering back and forth on that. I will just say for right now, I'm going to say C tier. It's a tough league with a lot of good coaches. Like There are not many bad coaches in this league right now. So because of the unknown on what to make of that resume, I'm just going to stick him in the C tier. But admittedly, there's a lot of room to change, either really up or down for Brennan based on how this year goes. Neil Brown. Neil Brown, this might be a touch controversial. It seems like West Virginia fans are much, much higher on Neil Brown these days after what he did last year, and deservedly so. That makes sense. But I'm going to go ahead and stick Neil Brown in the C tier. This is another guy kind of like Dave Aranda that was, except he's a year past where Dave Aranda was at. Last year, Neil Brown seemed like West Virginia fans wanted fired. He gets picked last in the Big 12. They turn that into motivation. They have a really nice season last year. I would tell you the schedule is going to flip on them and it will be much tougher this year than it was last year, which may change things. But we'll see if Neil Brown does it again. If he wins eight plus games again, he's definitely moving up into the B or the A tier. But this is a guy who's only been 500 or, or, or above, or let me say this again. He's only been above 500 in two of five years in the Big 12. I just need to see more than that if I'm going to put you higher than the C tier in a league with this many good coaches. So that's where I'm at. Much respect for the years that he had at Troy, three 10-plus win seasons there. But at this level, I think right now he's trending at the C with an arrow pointing up, by the way. Probably would have been in the D tier last year if we did this then. Uh, Kenny Dillingham, speaking of the D tier, we, we just don't have enough on him, right? You have to right now put him there. He's only been a head coach for one year, and it was a 3-9 and nine season. They had the Jaden Rashada drama and that whole saga. I, Kenny Dillingham could well be a coaching prodigy. He might be great. Arizona State is a tough situation. They had all the Herm Edwards stuff going on. That, that's been kind of a mess of an athletic department. So I understand he was not stepping into a ready-made operation last year. But just because of that, and we haven't seen it, 
he's going to have to go in the D tier for right now compared to the accomplishments of these other coaches. Love the work that he did as an assistant at Memphis, Florida State, Auburn, Oregon. A lot of really nice stops there as an offensive coordinator. But for right now, he's in the D tier as a head coach. Here comes Sonny Dykes, a tough one to peg. A tough one to peg because Sonny Dykes, a couple of years ago, again, after the 2022 season, he makes it to the national championship game, beats Michigan in the playoff. You're thinking, all right, well, you got to put this guy in the S tier, right? Then last year, uh, sub 500 season, and you know, it's like, okay, what do you do with Sonny Dykes right now? I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick him in the A tier, and I, I definitely debated the B tier here for Sonny Dykes. In fact, I had kind of made up my mind it was going to be B tier until a last minute change of heart here, and some of that is because all the coaches that we're gonna have in the A tier or above, I feel like, get mentioned for other coaching jobs regularly which happens to a ton of coaches in the Big 12. We're, we're always dealing with those coaching rumors. I don't see as much of that really going on with Sonny Dykes right now. And my contention with the, the Max Duggan year is that, look, Max Duggan was awesome. That's a quarterback, though, that Sonny Dykes did not recruit. And that's a quarterback Sonny Dykes was not even going to start that year. Like Sonny Dykes started Chandler Morris. He just got hurt. So I have some questions there. Last year wasn't good. Quarterback play was definitely a problem. Sonny Dykes, though, is still recruiting very well. I mean, at or above the level that Gary Patterson was, I think there's reason to be optimistic there. TCU is a program that just has a really high ceiling in general because we've seen all those 12 win seasons that they've had even since joining the Big 12. So there's a lot to like there. I think Sonny Dykes, based on what he did in 2022, still deserves the respect of being in the A tier, but he definitely was knocked down a peg with what happened last year i don't think we need to discuss this next one very much guys you know where mike gundy is going mike gundy's going in the s tier mike gundy is a top tier big 12 coach unbelievable consistency if you go back and start looking through the seasons that mike gundy has been at oklahoma state it really is eye-opening i know everybody feels like he's consistent but how about 18 straight bowl games 18 straight winning season eight double digit win seasons and two of those have been 12 win seasons now yes only one conference championship in there, but this guy has been unreal at Oklahoma State, producing consistent, very good football teams. Came within an eyelash of playing for a national championship. I heard him say just the other day, he felt like that 2011 team was the best team in the country. I mean, they were they were damn good and just got tripped up by Iowa State and, and then got tripped up by the computers to not be able to play for a national championship. But S tier for Mike Gundy, and that's that's basically that. Joey McGuire. Joey McGuire has been rock solid, I would say, so far at Texas Tech. Uh, he recruits very well. The recruiting looks like it is still going in a very good direction. I'm going to go B for right now. A lot of upward potential there for Mr. McGuire. Recruits like a madman. I mean, he pulled in Micah Hudson, who was the first five-star recruit in modern recruiting era history for Texas Tech. Uh, that was also the highest rate of recruit in school history. Tech, before he got there, had gone six straight years without a top half of the Big 12 class. That has certainly changed. And uh, despite a lot of quarterback injuries, this guy's four games over 500 and I mean, had damn near same Big 12 winning percentage as, as Brent Venables, right, during his time in the conference. And Venables just got a huge, huge check uh, and an upgrade with the contract at Oklahoma. But I do still feel like we're kind of waiting for Joey McGuire to take the next step, right? Get into that nine or 10 win mark, really legitimately compete for a Big 12 championship. Last year, there was a lot of hype and then stubbed your toe right out of the gate against Wyoming. So if Joey McGuire can put together what the recruiting seems to indicate he is trending toward, then he's definitely going to be moving up on this list for right now. Just need to do it. Just need to go do it. But so far, very, very solid effort from, from Joey McGuire. Uh, Chris Kleiman, this is definitely an A or an S tier conversation. A guy who won the league two years ago uh, and has also played in a Sugar Bowl. He has never won less than eight games in a non-COVID year at K-State. I'm going to go S tier. I'm going to go S tier. As I record this here today, Chris Kleiman did just also land the first five-star recruit in school history at K-State uh, by landing Lincoln Cure, a tight end uh, out of Goodland, Kansas. So the recruiting has been trending in the right direction. We know about Avery Johnson. He just pulled Avery, uh, a nice running back, and Dylan Edwards out of the portal, too. So the talent level has certainly been upgraded at K-State. He's poised to compete for a Big 12 title again this year. He's won 19 games the last two years and uh, obviously has the FCS resume 
that we can consider here too with uh, with four national titles there. So I'm going to say Chris Kleiman does get the bump up to the S tier. Gus Malzahn. Uh, in 2013, you would have said Gus Malzahn, S-tier coach, right? Goes to the national championship game with Nick Marshall at Auburn. He lasts eight years at Auburn, which is one hell of an accomplishment. I, I still think Gus Malzahn belongs in the A-tier. I like Malzahn a lot. Um, I think this is a legit coach. I mean, he was 11 games over 500 in the SEC, and he did that while playing in the shadow of Nick Saban. He's in the SEC West, right? The toughest division especially at that point in time when he was there, it was kind of pre Georgia rise, the toughest division to be in, in football. He's doing it with Saban with crazy Auburn boosters, fans all around him. We've seen how crazy that environment has been since. And the guy did pretty darn well. It's a little like Bo Pelini, Frank Solish esque that Auburn got rid of him. And then what they've been through since then has not been very good. In fact, making it eight years at Auburn, the last three coaches besides Gus Malzahn at Auburn, a combined seven total seasons. So just making it that long is a mere accomplishment. But Big 12 year one, I mean, it didn't go quite the way UCF wanted it to. I know quarterback injury to, to John Rice Plumley, But it's been six years since Gus Malzahn had a 10-win season. They won six in year one of the Big 12. I, I think he definitely could be an S-tier coach in a year, two years, three years. There is very much so that potential there from Malzahn because we have literally seen it. We've seen the guy coach for a national championship before. I think joining Gus Malzahn on the A tier is going to be Matt Campbell. Now I know some would probably say, Hey dude, that should be an S tier coach. Look at what he did last year. Dealt with the gambling scandal, lost his quarterback in Hunter Deckers and put together a really nice season where they went six and three in the big 12. I get it. I think he is very, very good. I do wonder about the ceiling. And I know Iowa State fans are going to be in the comments telling me about the Fiesta Bowl and the COVID year. A lot of wonky stuff happened the COVID year, man. Jimbo Fisher was really good at Texas A&M in the COVID year. I, I, I The biggest year that Matt Campbell should have had was 2021 when he brought everybody back. Things were back to normal in college football. They had half the All-Big 12 team, basically, on their roster there and went 7-6. and six. I think Matt Campbell has an exceptionally high floor. I think he's been very, very consistent. Um, obviously, he's won seven-plus games in six of his eight years at Iowa State, and that's a, a huge accomplishment based on the football history in Ames. So he's a very good coach. I'm just not quite ready right now to put him into the S tier, but if he goes to a Big 12 championship game again this year, that will certainly change things if he takes that next step and jumps up there. To me, the wrap on him right now is kind of – when you don't expect much, they're going to be much better than you think. And when you have high expectations, they're probably not going to quite hit that mark. So prove me wrong, and we'll move him up a tier. Uh, Lance Leipold next. This guy, I mean, look, I, I, Kansas, our rival. Obviously, I'm a K-State guy. Most of you watch the channel know that. But he's a total stud. Lance Leipold is very, very good. He's been a winner everywhere he's been. Whitewater, then he goes to the MAC at Buffalo, comes to Kansas, and... He takes over. I mean, legitimately, you can argue a program that was mired in the worst decade of Power 5 football that's ever been played. And within three years, he's got him winning nine games and beating Oklahoma. Like, I, the guy is a beast. He is a very, very good coach. Now, does he have a conference title ceiling? We'll see. Uh, it is a different kind of jump to go from the level that Kansas has been at, five and four in the conference, to jumping up to winning the conference. That's a different sort of jump that takes a different sort of skill set than building up the rebuild from nothing to where you're very, very competitive. Can he also rebound from losing top assistants? Andy Kolonecki is gone among a couple other very good assistants on that staff from last year. So those are questions that do need to be answered. I understand. But based on what he has accomplished so far, I, that is such an unreal, unreal rebuild job that he has done with Kansas so far. You got it. You got to put him in the S tier. And, you know, next on the list, we're starting to get crowded up at the S tier because next you get Kyle Whittingham. I don't think I need to explain myself here. You might be a, a Utah hater based on their social media fan base, but you cannot hate on this guy's resume. Seven double digit win seasons, three New Year's six bowls, two Pac-12 titles, 16 bowl appearances in 19 years. All Whittingham does is win very much in the same vein as a Mike Gundy. Their resumes are unbelievably similar if you go look at them. 
He's basically been like the Pac-12 Mike Gundy, and now he's coming over to the Big 12. So Whittingham, no question about it, S-tier, and, and that I think is an S-tier college football overall coach as well. Uh, Willie Fritz pictured here at Tulane, but of course now is at Houston. I like Willie Fritz a lot. I think he is uh, an excellent football coach. And to me, that's going to net him a spot in the B tier with Joey McGuire. Um, I've known about him a long time. He is a Kansas city native. He's from around the area, which is where I'm at. So I may be a bit biased there. He also coached my favorite athlete of all time, Michael Bishop at the junior college level before Bishop became the Heisman runner up at K state. But similar kind of resume to Lance Leipold. He is one at the JUCO level. He went to MIAA, FCS, the Sun Belt, then the American, and he just keeps winning and just keeps moving his way up the ladder. The guy went 23-4 and four the last two years at Tulane. Um, now, also, you talk about personal bias. I watched him beat the Big 12 champion K-State Wildcats in Manhattan. So the guy can coach. I think there's a lot of potential at Houston. He already knows sort of the lay of the land. It's a very similar job to what he had at Tulane. Big city. Not exactly a college town, but there are advantages to being in that type of environment. So I like Willie Fritz. I think he will be a good coach in this league. Scott Satterfield, just I didn't like this hire from the start for Cincinnati, and it definitely did not go well last year. It felt just like a weird hire, a weird fit. Losing Luke Fickle, really tough. I know Cincinnati was great. They had an awesome home field advantage at Nippert, but... I don't know. I mean, a really nice run at App State for Scott Satterfield, but he was pretty decidedly average at Louisville. Three games under 500. He never won more than eight games in a season. It just seemed kind of eh. And then last year, they're three and nine and one and eight. I mean, if they can get some better quarterback play, that would that would definitely help. But for right now, I don't I don't really know how you argue Scott Satterfield off the D tier in the Big 12. Um, this one, this is the one that's going to get me in trouble. Coach Prime, I mean, no matter what I do here, there are a lot of people who would tell me he belongs in the S tier. He's amazing. Look at what he's done with rejuvenating that program, getting people to care about it. He's going to win nine games this year and challenge for the Big 12 title. And then there are a lot of you who would tell me, total trash. What is this guy doing? It's a clown show. He is a D tier coach. There's nothing to it portal antics no substance it's just a d-tier coach so i'm going to split the difference and make everybody mad i will put coach prime in the b tier okay i will put coach prime in the b tier here is a fact colorado to me well here's a fact colorado was one in 11 the year before coach prime showed up and opinion is i think colorado was the worst power five football program at least the most irrelevant power five college football program in the country when he took it over Colorado had had one winning season since 2005 when he took it over. And I guess that's obviously still true now. They've had one winning season since 05. The relevancy really mattered for that program. And he injected a ton of that into the program. He also, look, if we, if this was just random coach, we'll take Brent Brennan, for example. Brent Brennan last year takes over Colorado, pulls them from one win to four wins. We'd say that's a pretty good job. That's a pretty good job. Like Colorado was in the doldrums getting them to four wins from being a one win program that you took over. Nice work. Coach prime gets treated much differently and we all understand why, but I think that that was actually in terms of what was accomplished win and loss wise, that was fairly solid for Colorado last year. Uh, he also, I mean, he did do a good job at Jackson state 27 and six better than I expected there. I'm not a coach prime hater, but I also get very annoyed at how he gets treated and uh, you know, people propping them up as a legit big 12 championship contender this year. I'm just going to fall in the B tier, but you can light me up in the comments for that, no matter which side that you are on, because I fully expect to, uh, to hear from people on both sides. Another really difficult one to finish here is Kalani Sataki at BYU. It probably depends on how much credit you're going to give him for the Zach Wilson era at BYU and how much that matters here at this point. I debated between B and C I think ultimately I go B tier for Kalani Sataki. I, I do think he's pretty rock solid, just not spectacular. He has had three nine plus win seasons. His record is 61 and 41 overall. But you got to consider level of competition. Obviously, that wasn't a Big 12 schedule outside of last year's five and seven season, which, you know, a little bit disappointing. Probably should have won that Oklahoma State game, which would have given them a uh, a bowl season and and maybe changed some people's minds in terms of the trajectory there 
and what Sataki really has going. I'm just going to say respect to the job that he has done in general at BYU and just being a pretty stable, stable guy there. I think they it feels like the program and the, they, like they need a little bit of life injected to be better this year than they were last year in year one of the Big 12. So we'll see. This could this could change. There's certainly downward potential there for Sataki if they struggle again this year to find their footing in the Big 12. But for right now, I'll go benefit of the doubt and give Kalani Sataki the B tier. All right. That's it. There's your Big 12 coaches tier list. I know a lot of you aren't going to be happy with it. Let me know in the comments. Like the video as well uh, if you are so inclined. But let me know where I'm wrong, what I got wrong about your coach. Uh, yell and scream at me all you want. Just let me know in the comments. And uh, take care. I appreciate you guys all watching. I will talk to you soon.